Hello, and welcome to this video presentation produced by the Centre for Army Leadership on the Army Leadership Doctrine. It's the second in a series of videos that we'll be producing over the coming weeks and months for the Army. I'm Major Paul McFarland. I'm the SO2 Leadership at the Centre for Army Leadership, otherwise known as the CAP. Today I'm going to take you through an introduction to Army Leadership Doctrine. We'll look at how the study of leadership has evolved. What is Army Leadership and who are our leaders? We'll take a look back at 2015 to the Army Leadership Review, the leadership challenges of the modern day Army leader, the Army Leadership Doctrine itself as an introduction, its frameworks and its models. I hope you enjoy. Leadership remains an elusive subject to define. There are 2.8 billion search results for the word on Google and hundreds of thousands of books on subjects available from across the world different sectors and academic authors, to sports and military practitioners. Leadership theory has been an area of study for over 100 years, and this gives a wide range of experiences and views to lean on when we're talking about what to include in the Army's version of what good looks like. Everyone has a view. Every Army leader will think about leadership slightly differently. This traditionally will have been built on their own values, their experiences, and potentially how they've seen it done in the past, with differing versions of success. Clearly we want that diversity of thought. We want leaders who have the willingness to try new things, improve their knowledge and their style. But if everyone bases their leadership behaviour on different foundations, we end up with good leaders and bad leaders. Something that coheres leadership thought and provides a central force for these differing views, in the same way that the planets orbit around the sun, is the Army Leadership Doctrine. It provides something to base our thinking on and will help to provide army leaders with a foundation of what is effective and what is not. As Bill Slim said, you all have the leadership ability in you. Develop it by thought, by training and by practice. Leadership is the most immensely personal thing in the world because it's just plain you. There is no one who cannot improve their leadership through a little study. These are the army's leaders. Everyone in the army has the ability to lead, and that doesn't even mean that they are an officer or an NCO. Leadership doctrine can be used by officers and soldiers of all ranks, all cap badges, the regular or reserve. Indeed, it has applicability to other organisations as well, as leadership has a number of similarities across other organisational contexts. However, army leadership doctrine codifies the British Army's thinking on leadership. Doctrine does not tell you what to think, it offers guidance on how to think, and the Army Leadership Doctrine is no different. The intention is not to restrict individuality or to stifle imagination, nor is it designed to be the sole source of information on leadership, but it provides a solid foundation to encourage further study and discussion. Army leadership is held in high regard by other organisations, and rightly so. We generally do it very well. It's based on over 300 years of experience of peacekeeping, counterinsurgency, counterterrorism and aid to the civilian authorities. The presentation that follows will give you an overview of the doctrine with other chapters to come down the line. So I hope you find it useful. What separates us from others is our leadership. We operate in a context that differs greatly from other organisations. One that requires leaders to make life and death decisions manage fear, gain motivation, build teams, and use teamwork in getting the job done, all while looking after our people, potentially in a war fighting scenario. It may be fighting the enemy, combating an insurgency, defeating a terrorist organization, training a partner nation's armed forces, or dealing with a national pandemic. The British Army practices values-based leadership, which draws on the motivations of followers connected to the Army's values and standards. The operating context is uncertain, complex, dispersed, and has arguably never been more challenging, and therefore it is important to have a guiding doctrine that articulates the Army's leadership philosophy. Army leadership is defined as a combination of character, knowledge and action that inspires others to succeed. All members of the armed forces recognise the fact that we have a contract of unlimited liability that we sign up to when we take the oath of allegiance this responsibility requires all leaders to be the best. 
as the army most often operates in a land environment, the human dimension and the brutal nature of this type of combat can put more distinctive demands on the army leader. Leadership should not be confused with commander management, although the latter two are certainly as important and perhaps we feel like we even use them more often. But how individuals exercise both will almost certainly be based on their leadership philosophy. This is why leadership is talked about so much more often than the other two. The truth is that we're always leading. It is an essential element of the moral component of fighting power. People determine the outcome of an operation. They maintain a force's moral legitimacy and shape values and behaviours to ensure success that is moral and lawful. It applies in barracks and on the staff as much as it does on operations. It is also worthy to remember our philosophy of mission command, which we should utilise in both peacetime as we do in war. A centralised intent with a decentralised execution. Telling subordinates what you want them to do, not how to do it, promotes freedom of action, empowerment, initiative and speed. Leaders should be comfortable with providing their intent to subordinates, but mission command relies on trust, mutual understanding and initiative at all levels, which can only be developed by good leadership every day. In 2015, the Army conducted a leadership review after the conclusions of operations Telic in Iraq and Herak in Afghanistan. Whilst not failing to recognise all that was good about Army leadership, there was some evidence of unacceptable behaviour. The small number of high profile transgressions on those operations were a clear failure to apply our values and standards. And this had a disproportionately negative impact on the Army's reputation, professional standing, and cohesion, as well as a strategic effect on those campaigns. In addition to these well publicised incidents, there is further evidence that not all of our leaders were getting it right. It is important to note that much didn't need to change, however the review came up with eight key recommendations. The first being to place leadership research and leadership development at the heart of the military profession, along with the establishment of a centre for army leadership. The second of which was the codification of the army's leadership thought through production of a doctrine. Overall, the review's outputs focused on improving performance of our leaders and our people to ensure that we delivered on operations and in barracks. We need leaders who are flexible, agile and ready for complex situations. We want leaders who look after their people and develop themselves and others in their team. The review finally identified an attempt to make improvements some things needed to change so we could professionalise our leaders. This focused on creating lasting behaviours that would see an improvement in performance of all. The review was clear that there were a number of enduring themes for leadership that did not need to change. The enduring requirement to inspire and motivate people to put themselves in harm's way for the greater good or for their fellow team members. The expectation of going over the top or through the compound door would remain. The ultimate liability decision to take a life would continue to be a possibility. The review also looked to understand what would be expected of our leaders in the future in terms of the changing requirement a more complex and technologically advanced world, relying more on digital communications and complicated equipment while facing a wider series of operational tasks. We could expect to be deployed in smaller teams across a larger geographic area and face a more complicated and capable adversary in many cases. All these changes would bring challenges for our leaders. The complexity added by long-range communications resulting in the tactical politician, the uncertainty of identifying adversaries, separatists, insurgents, or the increase in UK terrorism has made the context even more difficult to analyse. The expectation of working with other UK agencies, foreign armed forces as partners, and prevalence of international media is likely to continue to increase. Leaders also need to evolve to include the changing generation of followers who will become the leaders of the future. Our main target audience 
is generationally different from the serving generations to differing degrees. While older generations share much of their values, attitudes and beliefs, their experiences, including societal and technological changes, have driven their expectation of their leaders and how they wish to be motivated and led. Moreover, events such as the world financial crisis have shaped motivations and beliefs, driven in part by social media and the connectivity of the world. And there is an expectation of responsible leadership in public and private sector organisations as a result. This generation is more connected and more aware of world events than any of those that have come before them. At the same time, they are more familiar with technology and how to use it. Overall, there is a growing sense of purpose that extends beyond profit, that is morally sound and sustainable. Similarly, leadership, which is values-based, authentic and ethical, is in high demand. Finally, the consideration of the future needs to include the dynamics of autonomous systems, the decisions that may need to be made to employ them, the ethical considerations that will challenge our leaders. We also need to consider how artificial intelligence may change the way leaders make decisions. If an algorithm can make a better decision than a human about the management of risk, then that presents a significant shift in how we will achieve the mission. The doctrine, however, provides a holistic view of what we believe to be the enduring requirement for our leaders. And so Army Leadership Doctrine was produced and launched in 2016, owned by the CAL. It's a bite-sized document that provides the foundation of what good looks like for Army Leadership and provides that foundation for leaders to get it right. It incorporates all that we know to be good and allows our values and standards to be translated into successful leadership behaviours, which are provided by the Army's Leadership Code. And it's described by a separate video by W.O. One Andy Stephen on the CAL YouTube page. The document is easy to read, can be dipped into by section, and can guide leaders in leadership development activity. It provides all our leaders with a starting point, and it only provides a way to think, not how to think. The Army Leadership Framework provides a simple breakdown of how we conceptually visualise what is required of an Army leader. Its three components are what leaders are, what leaders know, and what leaders do. We'll take a look at each of these sections now to introduce what they cover. In further videos, we'll take a deeper dive into each. What leaders are? This section of the doctrine considers the character of an Army leader. All leaders in the Army should be a personification of the values and standards. Values drive behaviour, and therefore character is the bedrock on which leadership rests. The values and standards of the Army promote cohesion, a collective sense of what is right, and a commitment to doing the right thing. Courage, both physical and moral. Discipline, respect for others, integrity, loyalty, and selfless commitment are not just words on a wall or mnemonic to remember basic training, but they are a responsibility of everyone in the Army, and it is the leader's role to foster a shared acceptance and promote them in all situations, while both on and off duty. We hear about the standards less often, but these are how we see our values put into practice. Acceptable behaviour. Bullying, harassment or discrimination is not acceptable. Leaders must not tolerate it. Lawful. This maintains the Army's legitimacy and ensures that the values are upheld within the, both the law, at home and overseas on operations. Totally professional. Leaders must foster professionalism in all that they do and in people that they lead, which will provide operational effectiveness. Leading by example. This is one of the most powerful methods that a leader can epitomise to affect those around them. There's a strong human tendency to adopt the characteristics and behaviours of those around us, particularly those that we respect. Good behaviour, authenticity, and putting people first will make leaders good role models. Bad behaviour can also be infectious, so be careful and always lead by example. Responsible. Leaders must also accept this for themselves and their team. 
the leader always remains responsible for a task, even if it has been delegated. Leaders should also encourage others to accept responsibility for themselves. Influential. Leaders need to be able to shape people and events. Confidence and decisiveness are key, but our leaders must also develop emotional intelligence and understand people to be successful. A leader's genuine care for members of their team and developing trust will support their influence. What leaders know. This chapter is all about what is required in terms of skills and knowledge to be effective as a leader. Leaders must know their profession. They also must know how to solve problems, make decisions, and have the ability to communicate effectively. We must be a master of our profession, soldiering. We should have a deep understanding of our operating procedures and our doctrine, and this should be backed up with the knowledge of military history and behavioral science. Leaders in the army often need to make difficult decisions under pressure and in dangerous environments. Intuition can provide a useful method of making these decisions. However, leaders need to be able to step back and make considered decisions when problems are more complex. Critical thinking skills and using decision-making tools can help leaders to make the best decisions when under pressure. There is always more than one way to achieve a desired outcome and it might not be the same as the last time. This is connected with managing risk. A knowledge and ability to manage risk effectively, exploit opportunities and take calculated risks. They must also empower and support their subordinates to be bold and do the same. Communication. A plan is worthless if it can't be communicated in a manner which is clearly understood and inspires the team to put it into action. The appropriate method of communication is important. A brief, a discussion or a written document. The skill to use all will be essential. Nonverbal communication is also important. Mannerisms, body language and attentiveness can often be overlooked. So leaders should also pay attention to this so that they can control the negative ones and maximise the positive ones. It's also worthy to note that communication is two-way and as a leader you need to actively listen to ensure you understand the ideas, issues and concerns. Especially of those that you lead and to demonstrate that you have value in them and their opinion. What leaders do? The Army leadership model is how a leader puts it into practice. It's based on action-centred leadership and is the basis of good practice. The role of the leader is wide-ranging and ever-expanding and there are three mutually supporting activities that are at its heart. The three circles are independent but continuously interact. Achieve the task, build teams and develop individuals. First day a leader should establish the context. There needs to be an analysis of the complexity of the task but also considering the factors influencing the team and the individuals. A complex defence engagement task with multiple political and social factors will clearly be approached very differently to setting up of the annual regimental parade, but the model remains valid for approaching both. There will be considerations for each of the circles and therefore each should be thought about, balanced when possible and repaid when not. The leader needs to address the tension between the circles and find a way to re-establish the equilibrium as soon as possible. There is no doubt that in certain situations the task will be the most important thing and the drive to achieve it may see less attention paid to the team and the individual considerations. However, in order to achieve a task, the individuals in the team will have different strengths and weaknesses, which will almost always be a factor, with trust amongst the team also like to be a consistent and enduring thing across most tasks. It should be noted when this is balance is out of kilter, so the circles can be balanced later. A leader should find time after focusing on a task to reinvest in the team and give recognition to the individuals. This is just one example, but the model allows leaders to interpret it in their own way and for their own situation. The functions down the side of the model will also guide a leader through an intuitive thought process to achieve balance across the circles and to increase the likelihood of a successful outcome. They all need to be considered 
although the functions are not a linear pathway. Each function can affect each of the circles differently, and so they need to be consistently revisited, and some may need to be performed simultaneously. The detail of this model will be covered in a separate presentation, but this serves as an introduction. It is applicable to most situations. And so, if you'd like to be added to our distribution list, then please scan the QR code at this link and fill in your details to be made aware of CAL events and products that are released every month. Army leadership is held in high regard, and our leaders are exceptional at having learned what good looks like over 300 years of history on operations and in barracks. Challenges will be more complex in the future, and therefore as leaders we all need to be prepared and consider what we are, what we know, and what we do. I'd like to thank you for listening to this short introduction, and I hope that it was useful.